and I am starting uh, in a somewhat different way tonight uh, because we are presenting an award and I think it's perhaps fitting that I be standing here at the podium more as a parent than as a member of the school board. The award that we're presenting is to Mr. Albert Hutchin and for those few of you who do not immediately recognize his name he is a professional engineer who was at our schools this summer and who noticed uh, a structural deficiency in connection with the roof that we were putting on the middle school. And Mr. Hutchin was not at our schools in connection with this matter. He was uh, here on a completely unrelated matter. But he noticed the deficiency and he was worried about it. He pointed it out to those concerned. But when he returned to the schools three, week later, three weeks later, again, on another matter, he saw that no remedial action had been taken. Now, it's not easy to butt into somebody else's business, and it's not easy to blow the whistle. But fortunately for Cape Elizabeth, Mr. Hutchin is a man of high professional standards and has the courage of his convictions. He alerted town officials to his concern, and indeed, when we obtained an opinion from another professional engineer, it confirmed the danger. The rest of the story is well known. We took the roof off the building, and the danger was averted. But sometimes I'm still haunted by the specter of the potential catastrophe. And as the father of a son who might have been under that roof this winter on a stormy day, or next winter, or some winter beyond, I know that I speak for every father and every mother and every son and every daughter and also for every teacher and every aide and every custodian and every administrator, indeed for every member of the Cape Elizabeth School community, in thanking fervently Mr. Hutchin for his timely action. Mr. Hutchin, would you please come forward and accept uh, this plaque which we have prepared, which along with my few words of praise and esteem are just a small token of our gratitude. Now, I'd like to read the, uh, the plaque, if I may. It says, to Albert Hutchin, with gratitude from the Cape Elizabeth School community, your high professional standards and the courage of your conviction averted a potential catastrophe. I want to thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. First of all, I'd like to ask uh, any board members uh, if there are any adjustments to the agenda. Anybody else on the dais? Anybody? Uh, yes, sir. The Tuesday evening article. Sorry, could you say that louder? I uh, I'm not sure when when did that article appear. Yesterday. Okay. Okay. Are there any other uh, people that wish to make statements or pose questions? Rosemary Reed? Uh, yes, uh, after the board of the superintendent uh, on 5B, please. Item 5B. Yes, mm hmm. Okay. Would you like to comment uh, when we get to 5D? Okay, well, I think just we have one, uh, one gentleman who would like to make a statement uh, or pose some questions. Should we do it now? Yeah. Sure. Would you like to come forward?
Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Tom Skypeck, and I live at 14 Fenway Road. And this is in reference to the article in the uh, Press Herald Employees Caught in Tax Snafu, just basically um, a follow up done on the uh, cash in lieu of benefits story that's, that's been around. Okay, the first question I had was uh, the article stated $65,600 for 26 employees who took cash instead of health benefits. And I wanted to know um, if it was, if it should have been mentioned about uh, those employees who also took cash instead of retirement benefits. It should have been mentioned by the reporter? By the reporter or was that um, not mentioned to the reporter was the first okay. question I had. Uh, and was that $65,600, was that that one year or was that the total amount? Three years. Three, three. That was over three, three. years. Okay. Um, second question was the department will pay $3,400 in Social Security and Medicare payments that were not deducted from, empo from employee checks. And was that was the amount of the employer portion also paid and wouldn't that have taken the figure to about 6800 That's correct. Okay. Um, and it was $3,400 mentioned in the paper. And when was the decision made to pay these employee taxes? Yeah, why don't you take it? Okay. The discussion about, for instance, the uh, discussion that is in this article about the $3,400 is an automatic issue. The only issue that is not automatic is whether or not the school system has an obligation, especially given the fact that it goes over three years and that some employees still work for the system and some do not whether they have a moral obligation to cover uh, the other. It was the advice of the tax accountants that the system do that. It was discussed as a result of my meeting with the tax accountant, with the business manager, and with the board chair. We have not, since that uh, discussion, had a meeting or had a particularly clear process as to how decisions like that would be made. My own practice in the past has been with a finance subcommittee Amounts of that number usually are covered by a policy or a guideline that say there's a discretionary um, decision making process that allows something of that nature to be made in a timely fashion so that business can go on from meeting to meeting is not necessarily an item that would be taken up as a formal board agenda item. And I think that was certainly the nature of our discussion. That is, and that has been the tradition as I understand it here in the Cape, uh, depending on the size of the expenditure and if you have a recommendation from your outside independent auditors to uh, to do that and the superintendent uh, recommends it um, the chair usually uh, approves it okay uh, as far as the employee taxes go does this mean that the school board will also pay the taxes and interest on the back taxes due to these employees I, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question, but perhaps I can clarify. The only thing the school department is paying is a Social Security issue. Anything that was a matter of private income, that is the, what I believe is covered in here on the tax situation, is clearly an individual issue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. At what point in dollar amount does this become a non a, a discretionary versus a board approval? 
on, of an unbudgeted expense. Would you like me to answer? Sure. Okay. It would be my uh, recommendation as a matter of, I have a number of policy recommendations that I have been uh, working on or at least piling up. Um, I think this is one of the areas where either a finance subcommittee or a very clear policy set of guidelines on what kinds of discretionary um, decisions can be made. I don't think any of these things are generally made without discussion with the board chair. Certainly my past practice has always involved that. Um, and in some cases there may be uh, specific dollar amounts outlined and so on. I would recommend the board uh, have such a policy. <coughs> I concur because I feel simply <coughs> under the substantial enough to come before the board. <coughs> Well, 3,400 is automatic. I mean, that is not, that's an issue that the, the town owes, period. There's just no uh, ifs, ands, or buts about it. So we're talking about a discretionary amount of three dollars $3,400. And again, we had a uh, timeline problem in getting the letter out to the people who were affected by the situation. Uh, there was a tax amnesty deadline. The accountants were concerned that we offer an opportunity for people to get some advice as to how to handle this, all of which uh, put some, um, I think, some pressure on the office to get these things out and to attend to the matter. Uh, I certainly can appreciate your feeling, and I, uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with it myself. I like guidelines, and I like this kind of thing very clearly. But I am not troubled by the decision, and I think that it, again, under the circumstances and with the advice of our accountants, I think, and with obviously informing and discussion with the board chair, I'm comfortable that it was a thing to do. You know, I think in a larger board, if you do have a finance committee of two people, instead of really, uh, in my case, I function as the de facto chair of the one person finance committee, uh, and, uh, you know, will for the end of the year, unless uh, you all feel differently. Uh, but I don't think that we ought to clutter up, or a future board should clutter up the board agenda with approving uh, amounts which are, in which the decision is quite clear as to what we have to do, in which the amount is such an infinitesimal fraction of our budget. Uh, it, I think really that has to be, uh, uh, that this type of decision has to be made at a lower level than a full-fledged board meeting. But I think uh, the new board can decide that, uh, or this board, if you wanted to, you know, immediately implement something. But my recommendation would be to quite be quite careful with cluttering up the uh, the school board agenda. Essentially, I'm trying I'm trying to stay a little bit detached because I am personally involved. Because in 1988, my wife worked for the system and was one of those employees who received some of these non-tax benefits, not to her knowledge. And it has impacted me personally because I am one of those people that's going to have to go back and refile a 1988 tax return. So, I mean, I'm trying to stay detached. But well, I can certainly understand your very, distress. There's also very tight uh, budgetary and those type of things. And I think any amount over a certain, certain dollar amount should come before the board. If, if not only to make it public knowledge that we are doing something about it and not hearing about it in the paper. Well, I, and I concur with Charlie, and I understand what you're saying, Peter, about trying to keep the, the items on the agenda that we have it on a, every once a month basis as few as possible so we can spend some time on those. I didn't get a chance to read last night's paper. Uh, so this is news to me, and I think that it goes back to discussions we've had in the past that there's only five members of the board at this point. There'll be more later on, but I would really appreciate the fact that if somebody would just pick up the phone and give us a call and let us know what's going on. I've got a fax machine at my office. I know we have a fax machine here at Town Hall now. Um, if there's something that needs to be communicated, it can be communicated to all of us. I certainly would have been extremely uncomfortable if David Hench, the writer, had called me yesterday afternoon and asked me, to, or the day before, and asked me to comment on this. I wouldn't have had any idea whatsoever what we had done. So I just think it's nice to have, uh, I realize Peter's acting on behalf of all of us, but it's still nice to have a little bit more information than having to read about it in the paper. Okay, any other comments on that subject?
Okay, the, uh, the next item on the agenda is approval of the school board minutes of the meeting on Tuesday, November 13th. <coughs> Any comments on the minutes? Having just received these minutes, I will abstain from voting for approval. I move that the minutes be accepted. Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? <coughs> minutes are approved. D, the business manager's report. Thank you, Peter. This is not a, a scheduled quarterly report. However, I would like to, to highlight some of the activities that have occurred through the month of uh, November. Uh, to date, we have, we're pretty much on, on target as far as the receiving our revenues. We get received 43% uh, to date, or $3.8 million out of a possible 8.8. .8. The following page summarizes our expenditures for the uh, five months up to November 30th, where we have expended 40% of our, of our, for our budget as compared to 36% last year. However, please note that November of this year, we did have three perils as compared to three perils for the teachers in December of last year, which represents about 2.3, 2.4%. So, you know, as far as comparing year to year, we're pretty much on, on the level. Next page highlights the uh, revenues and expenditures for the federal and state uh, programs. We do anticipate $183,000 this year in federal and state aid over and above the general program. Uh, to date, we've received $116,000, expended $28,000 with a surplus or two to be spent of $87,000. Uh, the school lunch report on page 33. Uh, November, we did transfer the $25,000 that was appropriated in the general program to support the, school, the food services program. Uh, aside from that, we would have had uh, $30,000 in revenues for, for November as compared to expenditures of $33,000 or roughly a uh, $4,000 loss. To date, we are have a, a, a loss in the school lunch program of $20,900. However, we carried forward $43,891 from June 30th as a loss. Yes, Charlie? Why do we carry over loss? Do we carry over loss? I mean, once the fiscal year ends in the end of June. Why yeah. do we carry over loss in just this one account? It, it's a self-supporting program. It's got nothing to do with your general program. In other words, if we were to have, it's like community services. If we would end up the year, which we had in the past, of, of, a, of a profit, that profit or the income would be carried over into the, the, uh, the year after. I think Charlie's question is a very good one. And uh, it just, it, you, you can project it forward and you would end up with the $289,000 <laughs> deficit in the year 1999. Well, well no, at some, at some point, at some point, this is the first year, 1991, that the, that the school department through the, the general program has allocated <laughs> some money for the, uh, for the uh, school lunch program. Hopefully, if we can take that loss Right now, twenty thousand nine hundred dollars, and possibly decrease it to I don't know five or ten thousand as a loss for year end. Then whatever we put into the budget for next year will offset that well, and move forward. See, I, I think at the end of the year we ought to close out our accounts and start again. And it's very confusing to we, us and to the to the public can, when something goes over the year end. No, I understand. We can do that. What I guess we need to do is come to you people, let's say like in, in June, June 15th, when the school lunch program is closed and the books are, are done, the bills are paid, and report to you and say, you know, we are five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 short in the school lunch program, and at some point get you know, authorization to transfer that money from the general program to the school lunch program. And then start the year as a, a zero uh, balance. Yes, Lord. 
how does this compare to the loss we had at this point in time last year? Uh, very well. Last, I looked at the inventories today, and uh, by the way, in January, I should have a, an updated program on, on the new uh, Mac, Macintosh as to how to report the school lunch, considering, taking into consideration the inventories, the unpaid bills, things of the sort. I looked at the numbers today. Our fund balance right now is $15,000 better than it was last year at the end of November. And that doesn't have anything to do with carryovers, or it does have to do yes, with Yes, it carryovers. does. Well, it, we had a, a just, loss just what we spent from July 1st through the end of November, not disregarding carryovers, how do they compare? All right. Uh, last year, we had a loss at this time of $11,000 for the month of November. And right now, we have a loss of? Roughly four this month. I don't want to know just for November. I hear what you're saying. Let me, uh, if, if I take the 25. I'd have to call you. I can't. Okay. I'd can't like to know that. that. Yeah, I will. Just, and, and I think that would be a nice comparison to have each month. I, I see it we will. do that in your comparisons and some of the other categories, but it would be nice. I think we're we're all um, very aware that this th this is a loss, and, mm. and I think we want to see that it's as minimal as possible. And a good way is to compare to see if we're doing any better. And I don't know how to do that by just getting this year's figures. Uh, our, uh, no, I get you that. Our revenue is at the high school. Our, our very, they're, they're great. They're up to over $800 a day almost, which is, and then we get the same enrollments as last year, where last year's revenues were like $650 a day. Well, they ought to be, because they're really charging a lot of money. I agree. I mean, it's costing kids $3 to eat just a minimal lunch at the high school. So that's why I'm surprised there's a loss at all. Hmm. Seems like that. There is no loss at the high school. It would be at the uh, the other two schools. But I will. Charlie, we ran away with your, your question. Did you we get a chance to finish? No, you got my answer. But, but <laughs> the reason I asked that was because we are now pointing, pointed out that this is a self-sustaining sustaining program. It's not any longer. We're subsidizing. Absolutely. I think it should be closed out at the end of the year. I couldn't agree more. We we'll make loss. note, you know, we'll... Uh, Come May 30th when we do present the, the financial report and two weeks later when we do close the books for school lunch, which we can do as soon as school gets out, we can report to you people and, and make the necessary transfers with your approval. <coughs> Good. The following two pages highlights the community services program. Uh, they have taken in to date $263,000 and have expended $205,000. The last item on my reports would be the enrollments uh, for the month of, or for December 1st. 1,571 students as compared to 1,569 for last month. Uh, based on, on these numbers and based on, uh, Pete and I went to a, a workshop last Thursday night at, uh, what was it, uh, PRVTC. Uh, Cumberland County as a whole has increased like 8.9 percent as far as uh, as far as uh, value for 92, 91. I'm sorry. Cape Elizabeth has increased to 6.4 percent, which is below the county and which is quite uh, a bit below the state average of I believe it's like 16 or 18 uh, percent. There's a few other counties out there that have really taken a, a blow next year. So based on those numbers and based on our our enrollments uh, staying steady or even uh, having a little increase, uh, hopefully, if the state should stay with the same funding formula as it does as it has in the past, we probably will pick up one or two percent more in state funding than we did this past year. That's all I have. Unless you have any questions. No further questions. Okay, could we have the comments of the middle school representatives, please?
Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, good morning, um, school board member. Um, good, uh, good evening, school board members, superintendent, Mr. LaBelle, and Ms. Brown. I'm Rachel Walls, and this is Matt Hayden, and he'll be presenting with me tonight. Um, on November 30th, there were 12 awards given to the sixth grade students for various accomplishments and achievements. Um, there were two from each homeroom. December 18th is the band and chorus concert at the middle school gym. 7 p.m. They have been working very hard, so it will be very good. Um, December 19th, the seventh grade will be going to the Boston Museum and spending the day there having lunch and enjoying the exhibits. Uh, February 8th is the middle school talent show at the high school auditorium. Uh, at this point in time, they're just signing up. Uh, the seventh and eighth grade girls basketball teams are entering the second half of their season. The eighth grade girls have three wins and four loses. The seventh grade girls have six wins and one loss. Okay, and um, as you may or may not know, Jeff Sarbrick and I attended the ordinance committee meeting um, in November. And that's the night that we informed the ordinance committee, um, which is like Councilor Greenlaw, uh, McLaughlin, um, Councilor Jordan and Creelman, um, that we are looking into buying a school board for the outside um, playing fields of soccer, boys and girls, and boys baseball. And we'll be getting more information on if that will be approved or not. And um, these last two are pretty much questions. Um, we um, have read in the superintendent's report that um, there, um, it said like essential programs and it's kind of important what we know, um, that we know what the essential programs are to keep because we've heard rumors um, around school that industrial technology, um, home ec and arts may be um, cut or cut back and we were just wondering um, if there's anything that you guys have to say on that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Connie. I think that's turned on. Um, if you're ret referring to a p report that was sent out as part of this, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, I think it's extremely important to be clear that neither I nor anybody I've talked to is making any attempt at uh, prejudging or making decisions tied to budget at this point. We are certainly very much aware, um, and the paper articles we we're talking about here, we have an article in today's paper about the council meeting last night. It is clear that CAPE is facing a difficult budget session, but um, <coughs> essential programs. Uh, refers to just that, what is an essential program. Um, and uh, the process that both your teachers, the administration, ultimately the members of the school board will be going through, uh, will be weighing all kinds of factors. Um, I think it really is important to try to defuse rumor mills. Um, there is no uh, decision at this point. This process is going to be a difficult one. It's going to be a difficult budget. But it would seem to me from all the discussions I've had with people that we're interested in uh, maintaining a balance of programs and in keeping the uh, best interests, uh, particularly, obviously, of the students in mind. Okay, and another thing is directed at Mrs. Soland. Um, we were just wondering if the school board has made its decision if um, Mrs. Goldman will be considered as a candidate for the permanent superintendent. I will be reporting on that in just a minute. And oh, you'll okay. Have your answer. <laughs> and um, Mr. Leslie, it has come to our attention that um, you don't have a baseball cap, um, and we, the middle school students, would like to present you. Well, thank you very much. I'm, thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Do I have to wear it <coughs> during the whole meeting? Can I just wear it for a while? 
<laughs> the whole meeting. <laughs> Thank you. The uh, high school representatives. Good evening. After persistence from both the faculty and the students of the high school, the Pledge of Allegiance found its way back into our schedule. And we're now saying it every Monday morning, second period. And what we're doing is, instead of just having Mr. DeFusco say it, we're trying to get some students involved and on a rotating schedule, have them come in and say it. Um, the SAC, which is the Student Advisory Council, is planning, looking into the possibilities of having a, a one-day exchange with Greeley High School to explore the differences of student governments. And we're hoping that some people from our SAC can exchange with their, their committee and we can see how, how they run things and they can see how we run things and hopefully get some interesting input. Um, the SAC has also been working on a, on a constitution to sort of set up um, our structure and, and our program. Um, it's been ratified by the SAC. All we have to do now is sign it and I'm hoping that that will be ready so I can just dis distribute that next the next meeting, so you can look, take a look at that. Um, as you know, the budget process has <coughs> begun, and I just want to let you know that there are three student representatives <coughs> involved with that. So we're, that's Peter Glasser, Laurie, and I. We're helping out with that. And the high school band and chorus concert is Monday the 17th, and we hope to see you all there. Another successful dance was held um, last Saturday night, which was sponsored by the sophomore class, and we're looking forward to having several more throughout the year. This year, the SAC has decided that instead of Winter Carnival, which hasn't always been successful in the past, that we're going to have our Spirit Week in March, and that will be called March Madness, and plans are underway for working on that. Also, we have received a salad bar, which everyone seems to be enjoying. And there are a number of new clubs in the high school this year, one of which is um, an environment club called Students for Environmental Action. And they're working on various recycling projects and they're trying to do some fundraisers. Also, Students Against Drunk Driving has been reactivated and reorganized. And they are looking into <coughs> trying to spread their message not only to the high school but also to the middle school and elementary schools as well. There's also been a skeep club formed and the National Honor Society has become an active club in our school. Thank you. Excuse me, could I ask one thing? Um, last week, or excuse me, last <coughs> month, I asked the uh, middle school youngsters if I could have an invitation to a meeting. Um, and this month, I would like to hear from the high school. Uh, if you want to just let me know when your next meeting is and or the next meeting you would like to have me there. An SEC meeting? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, certainly, we can look into that. Okay. See well, let me know. Good date. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The next item on the agenda is the interim superintendent's report, and I would remind the interim superintendent that the tradition here is that she chairs this I part of the meeting, so that uh, you get to orchestrate who <laughs> speaks and when, and when they stop. And <laughs> I think it's all me anyway. So. As I look down through In that case, give me the gavel back. <laughs> <laughs> you may want to <laughs> shut me up. Um, thank you. The first item is fairly short. Uh, I think unless you have any particular comments, it's not intended to be an action item unless uh, you see fit to take action. The question was raised uh, regarding energy issues, whether or not this the teacher workshop days that are scheduled for the 3rd and 4th of January might be more appropriately placed later in the year so that the buildings could remain um, relatively uh, heated. And I was going to say unheated. We never, of course, turn off the heat. You have to keep the heat on, but with the heat down. Uh, I did discuss this with the Administrative Council um, and a couple of board members who were at a meeting that uh, where this came up, and uh, it's certainly my recommendation that you stay with the calendar that you have but I did want to make you aware of the fact that that discussion had been raised and we have at least looked at it but it seems as if plans have been made uh, and at this point uh, especially in light of uh, Dee's looking into the uh, energy situation I can't see that it would necessarily 
result in any significant savings. We also, of course, will be having construction work going on in the middle school or in actually the elementary, um, I mean the intermediate section of the um, of that building. And we would be keeping the heat up a, a little bit in that boiler for that reason anyway. Uh, unless you have any questions about that, I will simply inform you about that and go on. I did include in your packet two uh, uh, separate reports, but they basically are uh, one, um, having completed a number of one-on-one uh, -on -one and small group interviews, as I explained to you uh, two months ago when I started, I thought you might be interested in seeing the, uh, the summary. I don't think that they are necessarily uh, earth-shattering. In fact, if they look familiar to you, then I will have succeeded because I am actually attempting to mirror back what people have been telling me. Um, those are public documents. Uh, I have other copies in my office if anybody is interested. Um, and I hope that, that perhaps they will um, spark some discussion and that we'll make at least a thoughtful reading. And unless anybody has any comment, I'll keep right on going. Tick these things up. Okay, roof report. Uh, there are a number of issues, some of which I haven't, uh, they happen fairly frequently and fairly in an ongoing way, and I haven't uh, necessarily got them all in your packet, so I'll have to uh, fill in the blank, so to speak. Number one, after opening bids um, on the connector and D-roof uh, structural work, I have included in your packet a summary of those bids and an explanation of the uh, recommendation on the awarding of the bid. Again, I think this is another one of those issues, partly because I'm coming in on the middle of it and partly because we probably uh, do need to have a clear understanding of exactly uh, what process you wish to follow. Although I have been in touch with um, the pertinent people, particularly the uh, board chair, uh, it's our timeline has been such as that we have had to proceed on the strength of the vote of our October 24 I think it was the 24th, wasn't it? Special meeting where you authorize the superintendent to make arrangements and go ahead with this uh, project. At this time, however, I want to uh, point out some issues that didn't turn out exactly the way we had thought they would and uh, give you my sense of how we should handle that and then obviously take direction from you. Uh, number one, the bids came in higher than the estimate that we were originally given. Um, if you add the two estimates, uh, they were somewhere between twenty-five and thirty thousand, and actually the project is about—it's uh, a fifty-two thousand dollar project. The explanation for that higher bid is the, um, the fact that we are very concerned about having that structural work done during the Christmas vacation time, so that it will impact on class time as little as possible. Um, number. Uh, two, I should point out that we took the second lowest bid, although there were only a few hundred dollars separating the two lowest bids, because an equally important issue on the competitive bid process was timeline. And the next lowest bid was the one that was uh, giving us a January 6th timeline completion as opposed to a later in January timeline. Uh, we discussed that thoroughly with the engineers and um, uh, we're certainly following advice on that one, but I do believe that that is clearly an advantage for us. Any, any work going on in that area will uh, complicate school in a variety of ways, um, and although the work is not as extensive as uh, tearing out a building, gutting it, and rebuilding it, it is still going to create some disruption. So if they can complete by the January 6th uh, timeline, which they have said they will be able to, we will uh, be able to avoid a lot of hassle. If they do not complete, you should be aware that in the bid specifications there is a uh, per diem um, charge that will be, uh, will be in effect. So I think that I'm satisfied that they will do the best they can and hopefully it will all come out of that. Um, I think an equally important issue, of course, is that we have been operating under the assumption that we are covering this project as part of your original roof bond issue. Now, in researching that a little bit, talking that over uh, with the town manager, I'm becoming aware that obviously you were not going to the council with a uh, specific request for structural work. And I think, again, I, I may be a little 
unclear about that, but it's certainly this is my understanding, and if I'm wrong, you can correct me. But when you go to the council for a bond, obviously you have to have a list of projects. Uh, and although in some cases something occurs that you don't know about and there's some latitude as to how that bond, what that bond covers, in this case, since a structural engineer had not been directly involved, the fact that you need structure to um, help support that roof was not specifically tagged. In discussing that with Mr. McGovern, I feel the best thing for me to do is to summarize all of this information in a memo for the town council and to indicate that we certainly uh, hope that they will agree that this is a, a reasonable request, that this should be covered by that bond. Had you followed a process where you hired a structural engineer first, uh, all of these services would be part of that. Um, the planning and the analysis of the roof and I, they would have made this, I'm sure, the same recommendation as far as that specific piece is concerned. So it seems to me that logically it is all covered by that, but in order for us to um, maintain some kind of coherence here, uh, I need to ask the council for guidance and uh, hopefully they will understand the dilemma that, that is facing us with this. Uh, there should be enough left in that bond to cover the basic um, costs of the um, project. We also have about a uh, $4,000 cost in the small amount of asbestos removal that's required. Fortunately, we found in completing or continuing our testing, um, there was minimal uh, asbestos in this particular job, but uh, even minimal asbestos requires a separate uh, routine, and we have gone through a bid process on that and so forth, so that's all set up. Um, I think the, uh, the, the final piece on that is that uh, when we open the bids, uh, you may recall that in our October meeting, which is basically the meeting where you authorized us to go ahead with this project, um, you were given, well really, you were given realistically two options. One was to remove the trusses and re-roof or patch or do whatever to make winter uh, safe the original roof. The other was to insert structure and it looked like those would be about the same cost. So when we opened up the bids and we found the costs for this were higher than we had originally had uh, estimated, I uh, asked the engineers if we should rethink that taking off the trusses and so forth. I mean it was certainly not a timely time to do it but at the same time I felt it was important to clear up whether or not that was a much cheaper process and let you know. Uh, they are recommending strongly uh, that we continue with the structural work because uh, as they got into the building and doing the design for that repair or additional structure, they became aware the building uh, really needed that to bring it up to code. Uh, furthermore, any renovation you plan to do in the building certainly has needs for renovation. Uh, would require it, so that it is the most sensible approach at this point. So in summary, on the roof, we are, we have uh, taken the uh, authorization we got in October. We have marched ahead with a competitive bid process, both for the major work and the, the smaller, much smaller piece of the asbestos removal. Um, we have found that it is more expensive. It's primarily more expensive, by the way, I should make clear, that we are doing this at a time when there are holidays. We're asking people to work probably evenings, weekends. Obviously, this is the most expensive way to do a project, but we have, I think, to balance that uh, concern against uh, what, what would we do as far as the educational program is concerned, and I frankly feel that this is the best of the various choices we have. And the final thing to uh, the necessity to uh, uh, summarize all these issues in a memo to the town council uh, to indicate that we are uh, operating with a budget that we hope will be covered by the, uh, their permission to continue to use the bond monies. How much money was left in the bond that we originally had? Or is there enough to cover 50 some odd thousand dollars? Yeah. No, there's 80 to 100,000. Okay. In the bids that came in, was weather a factor? What happens if we have a major storm? I mean, are, are things that can go on going? I believe so. I think the only weather factor that was uh, brought to my attention was the fact that we still are looking at a situation if we should have a very heavy snowstorm, we would probably uh, have the obligation to arrange to have snow removed from that roof until the structure is put in it. Uh, and they, the contractor is telling me that will be our responsibility. 
Um, but the, um, I, it's my understanding that the bulk of this work is inside work. You're going to talk about Hanko? Yes, I am. I just was finishing the roof. Okay. This, pe this roof. This roof. Any other questions? Marching on. Another roof situation. Last Tuesday, um, Panko had a little problem. <laughs> um, the good news is is that uh, it appears that it's a seam split, and a this was a glue down rubber membrane roof, um, and that once the seam was lifted with the kind of rain and wind that we had last Tuesday, uh, it apparently uh, really lifted the membrane and allowed uh, just a torrential downpour into the central part of Pine Cove right outside the main office area. Um, I do want to point out that Chairman Leslie was there on the spot and I think climbed up on the roof as a matter of fact. I did not. I was there. But so it's only a one-story roof though. I'm just, I'm, I'm a thrill seeker. <laughs> and uh, I also want to compliment uh, Barbara Powers and the entire staff. They were really wonderful. Um, this is a, a kind of a disconcerting thing to have happen because uh, we obviously called the uh, fire chief. We thank him and the uh, the town uh, code enforcement officer for coming over and helping us decide well, how we should cope with the situation. Um, we could see water getting into the lights and electrical work and we didn't really know exactly how um, safe it was to keep things going and they did in fact advise us to turn off the electricity um, and uh, Charlie and Dee and various other people were all there emptying water buckets. Um, it's one of those circumstances that we do the best we can. I, I know I heard personally from some parents who were not only understanding but appreciative. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mrs. Hannigan and the uh, ladies in the lunch. They uh, made, I think it was 150 fluffer nutters and put them on a cart and we pretended we were stewardesses, you know, handing out uh, juice and fluffer nutters. And um, so actually, uh, the teachers were wonderful, the kids were great, and we got through it. Uh, now, the issue of what are we doing about the roof. Well, the roofers have been there. Um, this is, of course, a fairly recent roof, and I understand that they are guaranteeing us that they will, you might want to, you've talked to them directly. I talked to some of them, but um, they can fill you in. Anyway, they have been back, made a repair, and. The, the, they were back uh, Wednesday, there was ice on the roof, so they came back Thursday morning with some uh, portable heaters to, to dry off the water, and they did reseam the, the uh, the uh, seams. Is that to any cost to us or is this no. part of their warranty work? Part of the warranty work. Okay. Uh, that morning at 6 o'clock that roof did not was not leaking. Well, we had a walk through the building and at roughly around 7, 7.15 it just happened. When, it, and it, when the, the seam came apart it just the wind and it just lifted and it just kept going. Well in that particular part of the roof I can tell you because I was there mm -hmm. uh, was a part of the roof where water from all other parts of the roof accumulated. So the seam was broken uh, and was under about an inch and a half of water. So it had a steady flow uh, as if a faucet had been turned on. Uh, if it had been anywhere else on the roof, I don't think we probably would have noticed it. Okay. Moving on, the... Um we asked Dee to uh, analyze our energy situation. I think he has included in his in the packet. I provided you with, with four pages, I believe it's four, four or five pages of the first page uh, summarizes the fuel oil that we have used to date at the, uh, at the schools. And what I'll be doing from month to month is updating the, uh, the report. And basically what it does is that it, it it uh, highlights how many gallons of oil we did use last year at the Pond Cove Middle School complex, and the same for the for the high school. The price per gallon that we were paying at the time, and a, a cost. Uh, last year at the Pond Cove Middle School complex, we we bought or used 94,475 gallons at a cost of $41,000 or 43 cents a gallon. This year, the price, we're burning number six uh, fuel oil, by the way. 
this year to date we're, we're paying 55.61 cents per gallon for the same oil. Uh, we will be <coughs> updating the reports and reporting to you on a monthly basis. Uh, as far as the transportation department, I think is should I guess I should mention should we should we use the same gallonage in 9091 as we did in 8990? We would have a shortfall in the budget of twenty thousand dollars based on a sixty cent per gallon price for the for the fuel oil. Right now we're paying fifty five cents. That's correct. So I just stopped it by nickels. You know with some type of worst case scenario. It could be more than that, it could be less. But as the as we start buying or utilizing the oil, then we can the the computer will update the uh, price per gallon. The following four pages highlights the uh, transportation department as far as the buses and what we've bought for gasoline, diesel, and unleaded gasoline. There again, last year we bought a total of 27,000 22 gallons of either uh, regular gas, unleaded, or diesel at a cost of $19,028. This year, to date, we have purchased 8,773 gallons at a cost of $9,136. Then again, if we should use the same amount of fuel of gasoline or fuels for the buses as we did last year, we would have a shortfall of $9,000 in the budget realizing a dollar ten as a price per gallon. Right now we're averaging a dollar four cents. Yes, Charlie. I have a couple questions. The energy conservation system that we implement implemented this year, where does this impact our oil usage? The uh, the high school as off last Wednesday, the computer was brought in, the high school is online. The wires at the middle school and Pond Cove, I believe, will all be, the, the whole system will be online the week before Christmas. Where it impacts, hopefully, what the system will do is, is, uh, is uh, maintain or highlight areas that it, what the system is supposed to do is, is kind of shed its power to different areas of the building depending where you, you need the, uh, the utilities at the time. In other words, it'll go to, to a, a night setback when possibly when school is done, or the way you can, uh, the way you, you program the computer. Uh, hopefully, or what the system will identify is uh, is uh, peak demand. In other words, if we should have a a a, a, a shutdown and then the all the all the uh, lights would come on at the same time, that the system would would shed that and say, well, only certain lights can come on. Only certain motors at the high school would come on at certain peaks at every 15 minute intervals because your peak demand is based on any one reading for a 15 minute time limit during the course of a month. Then you're stuck with that for uh, nine months at 70% of that, uh, that peak. So we should see some savings in usage. You should see some savings in usage. Which would help. Last June, and I will update those figures for you, last June, uh, the next chart you'll see it in January will be the electricity bills of what we've utilized from last year comparing to this year. Uh, last year through June 30th we had overspent or right on the borderline utilities and fuel oil in the schools. Hopefully yes the system will identify some problem areas and take care of it and eventually save us some dollars. We've had a seasonably warm warm fall and early winter. Where are we in the percentage of usage so far? Uh, Where are middle we? Middle school is only expended 9% of their projected budget. Uh, high school only about 14%. Are we below where we would be at this point? The, the next thing I need to incorporate it in the uh, fuel off the buildings, and I made a note, I need to incorporate the degree days. So give us an idea as to where we do keep track of those. I need to set up a column and then give us uh, compare eggs to eggs. And the, the CMP rebate, because we're instituting an en energy conservation, that would be reflected more in the electrical? True. Okay. We did receive, uh, for the small project we did at Lund School, we did receive, I think I sent you people something in October, 700 and some dollars from CMP. 
The energy management system, once online, will be uh, assessed by CMP and a rebate will be forthcoming. Okay, in gasoline consumption, uh, in busing the middle school and high school students home at the same time mm -hmm. every day, we reduce the number of bus runs. Mm -hmm. That should help mm -hmm. our gasoline usage also. Sure will. Uh, and the other thing is community services also use, utilizes these, these buses. Um, is, has that been community reflected in this, their reimbursement? Their reimburses. So it, has that been considered a factor in determining the cost to us? Uh, what Sue does is she reimburses as she goes along with the, with the, the bus drivers. Yeah, the cost has been the cost has been reflected as far as the the salaries of the bus driver the fuel oil through the reimbursement is is uh, is uh, all of uh, Cape Elizabeth's okay. she reimburses us so much amount okay uh, I, I got a study going on right now the state told us to charge two dollars a mile for field trips and things of the sort that's that's a high amount we're contacting like 10 or 12 area schools to see what they're they're doing as far as community related services for you know the elderly or things of the sort okay one more question sure um, transportation costs are re at this point in time until the state does something different which they might consider their financial woes is totally reimbursable correct so it's it's still a two-year-old cost except for bus purchase which is one-year-old cost but it's reimbursed at a, at a rate higher than the general program costs are. It's not like nine or twelve percent. I believe it's like uh, fifteen or sixteen percent. So, as far as the gasoline costs, until the state changes that reimbursement formula, we essentially shouldn't see any shortfalls. Only temporary shortfalls. Well, you realize well, that's the reimbursement comes through in subsidy. In other words, you don't get a dollar for dollar. You know, all of those reimbursements are simply credits you get in your next year's subsidy so that we all of our transportation special ed and so on are upfront within the year costs that we bear then at the end of the year report we send them to the state and whatever we have spent we're given credit for as they put together our next year subsidy does that make any sense to me we, Mike? That's clear, you? But we, we will we will overdraft the gasoline accounts for this year mm -hmm. if it goes on okay. if that's what your that question is because okay. the state will only reimburse us in two-year-old costs but at a higher rate because it's transportation and it does for the general program then maybe we need to look at other ways of, of controlling gasoline consumption of maybe if we're busing middle school and high school students <coughs> home together in the afternoon. Maybe we should think about busting them together in the morning to cut down on some roads. I'm just... Yeah, it's enough. food for that, yeah. We are, you know, the drivers are, are cutting off their motors. They're not letting them idle. The weather has been great. Uh, I mean, God is with us, I guess. I don't know. I would suggest that um, administratively, uh, we will certainly have to look at uh, field trips in the uh, second semester. Uh, where field trips really tend to uh, bunch up is in the spring months. And um, at that point, obviously, we will have an even better handle of where we stand. And we've had some discussions about this as administrators, um, people realizing that this is a problem. And uh, that will be one way in which we will have to make some uh, recommendation. Well, even with field trips, if, even if there was a per pupil cost, born by the family or maybe just transportation to, to help offset that well that's a kind of policy issue we would have to come to you with a recommendation once we see ex you know again we have as you pointed out we've been extremely fortunate uh, in our accounts so far with the uh, with the warm weather uh, that you know just if things go that way we may in fact find that uh, the crunch is less the fact that we have very small bus runs, uh, one of the things about having three buildings and a 12 square mile school district is that the energy crunch is simply not impacting 
Cape Elizabeth the way it is, say, say at six, with 50 buses, 50 plus buses, and hundreds of uh, miles that they have to run every day in various ways. So that we have a more manageable situation. It's still obviously, if, if this scenario as estimated here were to go the full uh, nine yards, we would be looking at a $30,000 shortfall over what had been budgeted. It may be that the warm weather will allow us to get through the winter with one less fill up per tank, for instance, which is probably enough to almost make that up. Uh, we don't know that yet, but we will certainly monitor it. Just in line with Mr. Greer's question about uh, the middle school and the high school investigating starting starting the day with common bus runs, Miss um, Hudden and I had just been talking about that, and that's such, I think something we would like to investigate, and if it seems feasible, find a way to adjust our times. Um, perhaps we, I think the middle school starts at 10 of 8, the high school starts at 7:30, and see if we can find a, a common point somewhere in between. That would not seriously inconvenience people, but it might save again another set of bus runs in the morning. And if, if that would work out, I don't know whether the board wants to think about that before the vacation or when we would start that. But we could certainly talk about it right away. And it, I think that the buses, if we check out the, with the transportation director, the buses might enable us to do that because it's largely the ninth graders and and a few and some of the tenth graders in the high school that ride the buses the uh, upperclassmen who drive generally are on their own so I don't know whether that's worth talking about but we would certainly like to do that I think one of the reasons I raised that issue was the middle school especially seems to have a very tight schedule and if we could give them five or ten more minutes a day it might relieve some of the pressure that's on those students as far as lunch and, and some of the subject areas because of change in language arts that has curtailed some of the time on some of the other subjects, subject areas. That was, that was another lead in of why I suggested that. And just, just one thought on that, um, Charlie. I think we, we might be now talking about two different issues. If I heard you correctly, if we changed our starting time and added time to our schedule, that's a different issue than if we change for the bus runs, um, because then you're also you're making two changes. And I think we might want to think about that very carefully. I'm done. I'm done asking. <laughs> Don't, don't ask you any questions about the, the, the second change I heard was adding 10 minutes to our schedule and to the teacher's schedule. And that's the second change that we might want to look at very carefully. I think we've had some experience with making that kind of change. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting that we were thinking about combining bus runs. Uh, as we look at the tough budget choices that are going to have to be made this year, it's something that we definitely want to keep in mind for... Uh, fall 91 if uh, there is a way to uh, to save some dollars by combining some bus runs in the fall I think we're going to be looking for every possible dollar savings in the next few months so we shouldn't uh, if we don't use it in June or January let's not lose it uh, for the fall by the way the new bus did come in last week final do we retire one now that we have a new one well no I think I passed on a memo that uh, in February the state Police might take two of them off the road. One definitely, because of the body. But uh, I have sent that to the State Department as far as a request for funding for another bus. Good luck. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's my report. I believe um, you had a request to add to this. Thank you. I'm addressing the school board as Rosemary Reed, middle school parent, so no one is confused. <laughs> um, one of the items that uh, was discussed in the May school board meeting that I strongly objected to was the commingling of middle school students with high school students for the uh, uh, stated purpose of uh, changing the Pond Cove hour and eliminating some of the traffic on the buses. In light of the uh, energy crunch, in light of the fact that uh, 
the middle school and high school students are now being bused home regardless of um, that input and with the newly uh, announced administrative policy of no releases for sports for middle school which will cause uh, if not in basketball which is an indoor sport the outdoor sports in darkness later may cause a problem uh, there are many parents who did not support this uh, idea in May when it was presented uh, at a school board meeting who now understand because of uh, financial constraints the energy crunch and also the new policy on no releases for uh, away games that this is something that parents uh, many parents who were opposed to it originally I have spoken with them and they are no longer opposed to it so I just wanted the board to have that information uh, the other thing is um, I was interested to see that um, the CMP uh, rebate that uh, Mr. Ferguson referred to in the June school board meeting did that uh, roughly $28,000 ever show up in the revenue projections for the budget the, the uh, estimated rebate to my knowledge is not 28 but in, you know in the vicinity of our, from what I heard from our engineers is probably 12 to 16 uh, no it will when it does come in it will come in as a as a miscellaneous revenue and end up in a year-end balance so I mean there's a possibility that we'll have sixteen thousand dollars more well, that we hadn't planned I guess on I'm throwing numbers around here that uh, from back then this is what our engineer was saying 12 to 16 as to what the numbers are now I don't know I know that he has applied for the rebate but CMP will not give it to us until this, the system is online and operating 100 percent which will be sometimes in January I would think uh, once the money is received like I say it will be treated as a as a miscellaneous revenue and end up at, in the year-end balance Okay. It's not a projected income or revenue to us at this time. I'm just looking for every dollar, just I like know, everyone else to. is. <laughs> um, we have to every nickel. And and the follow up to my first comment about uh, the parents uh, relaxing their opposition to the commingling and the same start that would assume the same start time, and not additional time for the teachers. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, the next item on the uh, agenda is the uh, board chairman's report and uh, the first item was a budget update and I can assure you that I would much rather stand on a roof in the rain and the wind than to make this particular budget update. Last night we heard from the town manager about what the town budget looks like for next year and tonight it's our turn the good news is that we have now finished our forecasting model with its 20,000 calculations and it's truly a superb tool it allows us to look at next year and the years beyond with a great deal of clarity and precision and we're able to understand clearly the ramifications of our decisions and before I go on, I want to thank uh, one of our parents, Bill Riley, for the uh, very important contribution to, uh, to, this, uh, to the design of this model. It's an excellent job. The bad news is what this model tells us about how tough the budget year is going to be. Let me give you an example. And first, let's make the following assumptions. State aid remains level. That may be a very optimistic uh, scenario. Salaries for the entire staff go up 3%. Benefits, principally health uh, insurance, go up 10%, which is considerably less than it has been going up. All other costs go up 5%. That's roughly the inflation rate. All present staff and programs remain in place. Under these assumptions, the local real estate taxes, the school component of local real estate taxes would have to go up 14%. Why? There are three principal reasons. The first is that the career ladder, as it's presently structured, may see a large number of placements 
which could result in an overall teacher salary increase of 8.5%, rather than the 3% I mentioned earlier. The cash surplus will have been largely exhausted during the last two years. That's the same situation the town faces, as I understand it, from the newspaper this morning. And state aid will probably not increase, uh, and so the entire burden of whatever increase we have in our spending will have to fall on the local tax rate. Now, a 14% increase in local taxes seems high in today's very difficult economic uh, and financial situation. But if we only increase the school component of the local tax rate by 5%, then we will have to cut out about $750,000, which we would have proposed to spend based on the assumptions that I listed earlier. Some of these cuts could be made in administration, and maybe a few in supplies and a few here and there, but in no way would these total $750,000. Any additional cuts will have to come out of programs and staff, which in effect are the same thing. Staff salaries and benefits are 83% of our budget. Let me repeat that. 83% of our budget. The town council and the school board and all those concerned about our schools and our taxes will have to make some very tough decisions about how to spend what have now become our very precious tax dollars. It will not be easy, and those who look for simple solutions will not find them. In addition to trying to maintain what is absolutely essential in our present program, we must also look ahead to the probability that our somewhat obsolete and neglected physical plant will need some upgrading. I do not want to anticipate what the Joint Town Council School Board Space Needs Committee is going to, <coughs> excuse me, going to recommend. But based on what we've discovered in the last few months in looking into our roofs, it's very easy to envisage a several million dollar program simply to upgrade our physical plan. Assuming this were bonded, that would result in several hundred thousand dollars of debt service, which would have to be added to the school budget. My conclusion is that this year we must stick to our decision to engage in zero-based budgeting. We will have to determine what is required by law and what we ourselves feel is required by the needs of this community. And everything that does not fit into this core will have to be assigned some sort of priority. It is not an easy task, but it's one which we under intend to undertake with a determination, first of all, to do what is right for our children, to give them the best shot at doing their best in an increasingly tough world. And I think we can do it. Comments from the board? I think we have to do it. I, th I think the process has started. I think it starts essentially in the schools themselves, in the different buildings, with the staff and the administrators looking at everything from the zero base. And then the next level, of course, will be the administrators with the superintendent and ultimately with the board. But it has, it has to be a, a, a collaborative approach, not just an administrative approach. Oh, definitely. Uh, and I think that one thing that I'd like to reiterate uh, what uh, Connie Goldman said, and that is that no, the process has really not started. The work on the model that has been done has not done any what-if scenarios uh, involving any cuts. The only what-if uh, uh, scenarios that we've run through the program in a very preliminary way are what would happen if the inflation rate were higher or lower? What would happen if the uh, increase uh, in, uh, in staff remuneration were higher and lower? And uh, this, uh, 
this model, incidentally, is uh, uh, is available to to the public uh, with some reservations. Those that uh, deal with the names of uh, specific employees are under certain conditions protected. But uh, to give you an example, I uh, prepared and uh, gave to the Cape Elizabeth Education Association today at their request and under their assumptions two scenarios. And uh, they will be uh, presumably uh, discussing that with uh, their members uh, in the next few days. So the process is starting. It's going to be a hard one. But uh, we're going to do it. Okay. If there are no further questions on the budget. Uh, Jan, would you uh, report on the uh, Career Ladder Study Committee? Yes, please? thank you. Thank you. Um, at our last meeting, it was decided that many of the issues that we were discussing needed to be moved to other groups, um, such as negotiations. So the committee was put on hold until uh, further notice. Is that all? That's Any questions? Was there, no, I think I understand. So there's really no reason to meet, there, there were there some issues that that committee was <coughs> continuing to address and will be addressing in small groups or? No. 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 That, that's it. Until, you know, if, if somebody comes back to us at some point and says, here's a specific um, issue that we'd like you to, to deal with, um, then we could reconvene. But until that would happen, uh, we won't be meeting. So it was mostly financial issues that seemed to be coming up, and that was not? Um, financial issues and tied in with philosophical issues that, yeah. Since the career ladder is a major, major impact on, on the budgetary process, what options are there to us as a board other than, the, other than negotiations? Are there any? I mean, are we bound to the career ladder? I mean, are there any other options that the board has? Let me address it. As a person relatively new to the career ladder and to the system, I found this issue a very <laughs> difficult and uh, complex one, one that doesn't lend itself to easy uh, analysis or change. I think it is important to recognize that uh, perhaps yourselves, but certainly previous boards were involved in setting this in place. Um, there have been a number of people within the staff who have given a great deal of time to this. Um, it has, there are certainly controversial aspects, and I understand that in last year's budget process it became an issue that the community became um, involved with, perhaps more so than had been the case in the past. I think that the, what I saw happening in this uh, committee uh, was an attempt to air some of those issues. And there was genuine discussion and uh, some of it uh, very philosophical in nature. Um, there were some specific recommendations about what changes might be made. But when we really got down to, um, to any substantive uh, discussion, uh, we kept coming back to the fact that this is a major piece of the current contract, that negotiations are, in fact, beginning, or will be shortly if they haven't already. Therefore, it seemed um, a difficult situation to have both teacher association and school board representatives uh, discussing an item which essentially must be negotiated. Uh, we frankly did not come up with a solution to that dilemma. What we did feel I think it was a genuine feeling I heard it expressed at the meetings, and I also have since talked to some people individually. I think there was a real feeling that some possibilities were aired, and that once some direction is uh, given to this group or a group like it um, through the negotiated process, so we are a little clearer about what can be um, what can be shaped in that uh, committee and, and what belongs strictly to the negotiated process. Uh, we will be able to make some, I think, take some strides. But right now, it's looking for direction. So that direction 
from your perspective would have to come out of whatever the negotiation process? Yes, I think so. I mean, this is not a, um, let me try to contrast this a little bit. In some in school, this has been a major piece of, of what the Cape Elizabeth uh, as Teachers Association and school boards chose to shape as a major piece of school reform. It is, when you look over the last few years, uh, the most striking feature of what this district has done in school reform. Good, bad, or indifferent. However, one feels about it. It is a, an obviously um, uh, evident piece, as one would expect uh, after five or six years. Things happen that you might not have uh, predicted. It is time to reassess. It would be time to reassess any move that a, a certainly a major move that and so forth however it was incorporated into a contract contracts cannot be changed unilaterally they must be negotiated and the proper procedure for that would be for the parties to negotiation to agree to some kind of parameter as to what they want uh, referred to a subcommittee of some kind or you know some guidelines um, once things are in contracts, you don't just have a group looking at it and, and make changes. I mean, there has to be some kind of, um, of direction. I'll just uh, point out that last year, two years ago rather, um, when uh, we were negotiating the present contract, we gave increases that were 1% higher to the career ladder teachers. Uh, that was negotiated. Uh, something different could be negotiated in the next uh, round of negotiations. And it could be proposed either by the board or by the, uh, the association. I guess but, my question is just to understand the process. Yeah. Because having yeah. served on that committee and not being there for the last meeting, even though I supported putting the committee on hold because I felt our hands were tied. I just need some clarification of the process. Yeah. Well, it's, it's my understanding that the, it will, I, I think it has to come up in the negotiations. It can't not come up. Okay. Any further uh, questions on the career ladder? Okay, uh, Jan, would you discuss the superintendent search report committee yeah. uh -huh. uh, we've had our input sessions and we'd like to thank everybody for for their participation uh, last night the board met and developed the list of criteria um, <coughs> for uh, a superintendent search and I'll read the list to you now um, we would like this person to have experience as an administrator including budget development this person should be a scholar, someone with teaching experience, someone who is a collaborative decision maker, somebody who has good communication skills, someone who is actively involved and visible in the schools, a creative problem solver, someone with a strong curricular background, someone who themselves is a lifelong learner, somebody who has a track record of hiring good people, somebody with good interpersonal skills, somebody interested in, in student outcomes and assessment and evaluation, and somebody with a good sense of humor. Um, and to answer your question, Rachel, um, as part of our workshop last night, um, the board decided that Connie Goldman will be permitted to be a candidate for the superintendency. And the search will continue along the timeline that I described at the last meeting. Any questions from uh, the board? You're not on the board. Uh, any questions? <laughs> 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 uh, I, uh, I guess by default you get to ask a question, Connie. <laughs> I don't have a question, I have a comment. Uh, since I appreciate the, um, the, uh, both the requests and the, uh, the statement from the board, um, I would like to uh, um, make a statement because I feel that the, I'm in, I feel like I'm in an awkward position and my instincts when I'm in that kind of situation are to resolve it and get on with life. 
when I entered into the agreement to be an interim superintendent here, uh, it was with the uh, full intention of just that. Um, I had some things that I was working on that I was interested in, and I did not see myself at this time as um, being particularly interested in picking up another superintendency. Um, on the other hand, I also have to say that I um, like to think of myself as a reasonably flexible person, and I also think I am smart enough to um, see a good thing, to recognize a good thing when I see it. Uh, so that I have been giving a lot of thought to this, and uh, now that the board has decided to um, to uh, allow me to be a candidate, I have decided to do that. Um, I think that um, I have become increasingly interested in the possibilities, um, the challenges of this school district. Um, I see some very exciting things down the road, um, as well as some very positive things uh, in place already. Um, so I thought it would make it life simpler for everybody if I simply said that. I feel a little awkward. I know that the uh, reason why we entered into that agreement is that uh, being an interim superintendent and also a candidate uh, is not an ideal situation. But uh, I'm working with very good people. We will simply get on with life and go down with the process. And I thank you. Thank you. Connie, how did you uh, infiltrate the board chairman's report with a report on the school space study committee? Mm -hmm. I have no idea. I, 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 next, next, meeting, uh, next meeting, I would like to have something to report on under the superintendent's report. We can arrange that. You know the answer to this? Since I'm your representative on that, that committee, I was away the week the committee met. Yeah. Okay. And the committee wasn't disbanded? It was a very busy week, as you all can attest, and, and I missed probably about seven meetings that week. So. She was my representative. I see. Okay. <laughs> now I understand. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, we did in fact do the walkthrough of the middle school and Pond Cove buildings. Um, the administration was with us. Um, the group, I think, uh, had a good tour. We went around the outside of the buildings as well as the inside. Uh, we will be doing a walkthrough of the high school on December 17th at 2.30 in the afternoon. Again, I think I noted that in your packet, and if any of you would like to join us, you're more than welcome. Uh, what we try to do is to help the members of this committee um, look at the building or what the, I think engineers call the envelope of the building, which is the outer shell, and try to see what some of the problems are in the sense of window curtains that may need uh, some work, uh, as well as uh, we did, in fact, look at roofs, but that <coughs> was sort of secondary to some of the other issues. Uh, we've also had a, a follow-up meeting to the walk around. Um, and we made some agreements about uh, updating or at least uh, reviewing enrollment figures because, in effect, this um, study committee uh, was originally sparked by concern about increasing enrollment. Although the enrollment this year seems to be a little less than the projected uh, enrollment, uh, I do have to point out the kindergarten is larger than kindergartens have been in the past, with, and uh, we are in the process now of trying to get people to help us figure out how large the kindergarten will be next year by giving uh, us early registrations. Um, I think after the committee has had a chance to survey the high school and uh, to look again at some enrollment figures and to, we've also, of course, reviewed the NESDEC report um, and uh, the, probably the major um, space, or excuse me, building recommendation will come out of this. Uh, we'll be reporting back to the town council, and obviously we'll keep you informed about the need for some kind of a uh, building analysis. We saw a number of issues, particularly at the old part of the middle school, where we have some um, questions that need to be answered by hiring people who are electrical and mechanical engineers to look at the boilers, to look at the, um, the some of the wiring, for instance, is original wiring, the handicapped access issues, and so on. Even though efforts have been made to upgrade these things, to keep them going, to make sure that repairs are made, and I want to emphasize in all of this that the current custodial staff is uh, certainly making uh, very visible efforts to keep things up to snuff. We are dealing with buildings that are old enough to need um, study and uh, no doubt, as you said earlier, renovation. I thank you. You missed a lot, Charlie. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Any a, questions? It's a, it's a nice committee to serve. It's a nice group of people. 
Okay, the um, next item of business, uh, new business, Connie. Uh, yes, in your package you have two letters. One is a, as a resignation uh, from our elementary school uh, counselor, um, uh, James Freundlich. He is uh, letting you know that he is asking to resign effective January 1st, um, and he has accepted a position at the Woodford School uh, as their director, which uh, he indicated that he was taking a leadership role. and. That is exactly what he will be doing. He, I'm sure, will be missed. He's been here for 11 years, very popular member of the staff. Um, and uh, we are currently in the process of looking at what some of our options are. Obviously, we will be looking for a replacement. Uh, and the other request you have under personnel is a letter from Celeste Roberge, the, uh, one of the uh, high school art teachers. Um, she has been invited to uh, spend some time with the McDowell Colony, uh, which in effect uh, results in her asking for a short-term unpaid leave of absence. I understand uh, from uh, Frank that we have had uh, a somewhat similar situation in the p recent past, and we were able to find a well-qualified artist to fill in for the short term so that her request can be granted without uh, fear that the classes will not be taken care of. So. It's obviously a good opportunity for her. It will not be an expense to you because the, it is an unpaid leave, and um, for that period of time, her uh, will be covering the uh, substitute. So those are our two personnel reports. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I, I move to accept um, James's resignation. I can't ever say his last name quite. Friendly. 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 Um, with regret. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? No, I'd just like to say that uh, one of the things that uh, makes Pine Cove special is James, and I, um, I'm sorry to see him go. I know that there's uh, 11 years of children who've had the opportunity to go through Pine Cove and uh, see James, and I never saw James on the playground where he wasn't surrounded by kids. Uh, answering or asking all sorts of questions and answering them well. And uh, his place is a very special place for kids to go there. So uh, I know that there'll be a lot of kids that'll miss him. So I'm sorry to see him go. Yeah, I <laughs> echo that too. Uh, I think he's uh, done a magnificent job and uh, I wish him well in his uh, new position. I have one question about his, his leaving. He, he carries quite a caseload of servicing kids. What, it, what are the plans? I mean, I would hate to see January 1st come and kids come back to school and there's no one in place. Well, we are exploring some possibilities um, and uh, frankly, I don't think we have any you know, particular answers for you at this moment except to say that uh, clearly the staff, the administration in Pankov is shares your concern. So if you, if you did go out to, to hire someone else, mm -hmm. would you fill that position temporarily or at this time better? yeah at this time of year oh just about any uh, unexpected uh, uh, vacancy uh, is filled that way I mean it's filled for the rest of the year with the understanding that we will be reopening the position at the end of the year that's done because we have an obligation to have as large a pool as possible and sometimes you can make short-term arrangements that are perfectly satisfactory but may not be necessarily good for the long term. Sometimes we find somebody who just happens to be available for a short period of time and works out well all around. But we usually uh, make as a condition of employment for those kinds of situations the understanding it's finishing out the year, reopening, person may reapply and so forth, but that we like to do it in that way. Yeah. If, if I could just add, Connie, um, we're, we're real encouraged by some of the response we've had so far, Charlie, both internally and from some outside candidates hope to interview perhaps as soon as late next week and if not then um, on one of those two workshop days when we're back in January to try to have someone come in as soon as possible. I also want to assure you that Pam Vos who works closely with James is prepared to pick up on some of the more difficult caseload and be sure that transition is smooth. Okay, okay it's been uh, moved and seconded I believe. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? And, and 
I move that we accept a short-term leave of absence for Celeste Roberge. Second. Any discussion? I just want one question. Where is the McDowell colony? It's in New Hampshire. I don't know exactly. I thought it was in Bermuda. <laughs> right next to Pink Beach. <laughs> Petersburg, New Hampshire. You know where Petersburg is? It's up in the hill, sort of. Sort of. I've heard of it, but I have never known where it was. It's a beautiful spot. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. I'm all in favor. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to jump ahead of you there. Okay, now a, a state requirement is that we uh, nominate a superintendent uh, by, uh, I think, December 21st or during December. And so I would entertain a motion that we uh, elect uh, Connie Goldman, superintendent, uh, to. Um, serve until June 30th, I believe, is what we're doing in this case, isn't it? Well, could I just interject a little explanation? Sure. Because it's, this is such a strange thing to come up all of a sudden. Uh, there is a state statute, which no doubt at some point they're going to clean up state statutes, but, you know, like we all have our um, somewhat unexplainable things hanging around. Uh, I think the original historical reason for the statute was that they picked a date where school boards had to assure the state that they did in fact have a superintendent. This was to force boards who might not want to spend the money to hire a superintendent to hire a superintendent back in the days when they were trying to get boards to be more businesslike and so on and so forth. Um, that's all it is. It is sometimes tied to an evaluation of the superintendent or tied to an evaluation of the superintendent's contract, which may be done by local choice. But the only reason this shows up on every school board's agenda throughout the state of Maine in the month of December is it's an archaic statute. All you are really doing is certifying, taking a vote at this meeting so that we may send in the state form uh, properly attached to minutes that you indicated that at this time your superintendent is the interim superintendent. Good. Do I hear such a motion? Yes. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Congratulations. <laughs> okay, finally, a consideration of Connie, you have a request that we enter uh, executive session? Yes, I do, for the purpose of discussing possible construction litigation. I move that we enter uh, executive session to discuss possible construction litigation. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? 